Uh, my name is Shane Keen. Uh, I've been attending uh, Grace with my family since 2019. Before coming to Grace, I was searching uh, for several years. My spiritual background growing up was uh, Roman Catholic, and I uh, attended church regularly uh, and walked away from it in my mid-teens. Uh, there had been some darkness that had creeped into my life, and uh, frankly, I was looking for answers, which led me to things like uh, spiritual wellness, um, some Eastern religions, attended a Buddhist temple uh, regularly, and I just couldn't find the answers that I was looking for. It got to a point where uh, we had some close friends uh, who we knew uh, were Christians, uh, and they just extended us the invite to come attend uh, Grace and Port Jervis. I remember walking into Grace, uh, and it was like nothing I had ever experienced. Um, you know, it was warm, uh, it was inviting. It seemed like everything that the pastor was saying uh, was intended for me. And I knew at that point it was undeniable to me that God wanted me there. At the end of one of the sermons, uh, we began to pray, and the opportunity was given to anyone who wanted to turn their life over to Jesus at that point uh, to raise their hand, and uh, I did so. It wasn't long after that that I made the decision to be baptized, and uh, everything kicked off from there. Uh, got involved with as many uh, small groups as I could, uh, and most recently, uh, the most impactful has been uh, Every Man a Warrior. Uh, which has really taken a biblical perspective on what it means to be a man. Approximately a year later, uh, I had the privilege of seeing my wife uh, turn over her life to Jesus and get baptized. And uh, more recently, uh, my youngest daughter, Libby, made that decision herself uh, and was baptized this past summer. Since being here at Grace, uh, my life has <laughs> transformed. Um, people that attend there uh, honestly and truly care uh, about my well-being. I love coming to Grace because they showed me that the answer to that hole in the soul sickness I had was a relationship with Jesus. Oh, what a great story. Welcome, everybody. If uh, you're a guest, I'm Jared. I have the joy of getting to be the senior pastor here. Such a joy to have you. You just heard a, a, a bit of Shane's story so powerful, and there are so many more like it because of what God has done in us and through us as Grace Community Church. You, hear, you hear, heard an entire generation and generations to come transformed from Shane to his wife to his daughter and believing for more of that reality in the future. I spent last week talking about kicking the darkness, how God has called us to do that and ex expressed all that God is doing through you and your, and your giving and how God's using us in, the, in Orange County, in the Northeast and beyond. So it was my invite to you to join me and my family to give to our end of the year offering. So this goes above our tithes. This is completely different. As I shared last week, it is taking something and setting it to the side to give to the mission and ministries of who we are so we can go strong into 2024. So I hope you're praying about that. I hope you'll consider that. The information is right there for you so we can start strong in the coming year. Also, Shane mentioned uh, Every Man a Warrior. We have a powerful men's ministry, men's group. We are actually doing a men's conference. Write that down, fellas, at the end of January for two days. So I hope you'll consider coming back for that as well. Excited about our series. I think it's going to be helpful for you. It's already helpful for me. So let me pray and we will dig in. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. We praise you. And now our eyes focused on you. And so I pray, plead, Holy Spirit, Open your word to our hearts. Open our hearts to your holy word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So thinking about our series, Setting the Table, and the approach of this series is a very short series, is navigating how when we go into the holidays and we connect with family, how do we navigate conversations that go there? 
And so today's about that. Next week, we're going to deal with some politics and how to navigate that. And then the final week, we're going to talk about a little something different about if we have an empty seat at the table, whether it's someone we've lost or whether someone has just rejected you or rejected us as family, how do you navigate that through the new year? So keep coming back for that. So today, it's kind of a broad scope of how as a born-again Christian, and that's who we're talking to today. So if you're not a Christian, I'm so glad you're here. We're here for you. Keep coming back and learning who Christ Jesus is. So for the rest of us as born-again Christians, what, what do we do? How do we navigate it? So this week I was poking around online and there, are, there seems to be articles everywhere about the, and here's the word, the incivility of our culture, our, of our society today. So how we're uncivil to one another. So incivility has to do with insults, being demeaning, uh, inappropriate tone, uh, in, being impolite, unkind behavior towards son, someone to make them uncomfortable. To me, I would call it rudeness and rage. We're all angry, man. We, are, we live in a very angry day, and rightly so in some ways. But often this incivility is directed toward certain folks, such as customer service. Now, if any of y'all work in these places, you can go ahead and say amen, all right? Such as customer service, front desk, staff, airline attendants, all right, healthcare workers. I know, Julie. Healthcare workers, restaurant staff, retail employees, even pastors, even we get the all caps emails, all right? And that's okay. That's okay. But that's the day in which we live. I mean, it's so bad that there are actually businesses putting signs up as you walk in their doors that are saying, please be kind. Your behavior matters. Please be kind. Now, you put all that together and think about the holiday tables that are coming. And how all of that can overflow and slush into conversations with family at the table when all your family comes into town or maybe at the office party or what have you. And the big subjects that could come up such as politics or religion or even sports is explosive, of course. Or it can be little things that are lobbed out there such as the energy prices or for sure the Israel-Palestine war or things around the climate, or gun control, or Supreme Court decisions, or conspiracies, and abortion, and transgender, and gay rights, and immigration, and the border, and on and on I could go. Explosive topics that could be lobbed out there, and if we're not ready for them, it could seduce you into something that could go sideways. So we live in a very charged, hostile world, even to the degree that to disagree means hate. You can't even disagree with anymore, and that's what you bring to the holiday table or what sits there. To disagree means you're a person of hate. To disagree means this relationship is over. So how then, as born-again Christians, do we go into those kinds of environments? At first, we got to check our own hearts, and then we go into those environments, and how do you navigate it when it goes there? So today is about when it goes there, what do we do? How do we navigate these kinds of circumstances? So let's just jump right in. Here's the first thing you need to know or to be reminded of before you walk into the holiday gathering, and it's this. Know that you're already offensive. <laughs> you don't even have to be. You don't even try to be. If you are a born-again Christian, before you've even walked in the door, you're already offensive. So let's talk about that. How are you offensive? Because of the gospel of God and the scriptures of God. The gospel of God, let me give you this passage that kind of sums it up. 1 Corinthians one twenty three. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. So that phrase, Christ was crucified, that's a, that's a very general kind of way of, of, of showing us the entire gospel that we'll see in a moment. So the Jews are offended. That's those who would be offended who think they're, they're keeping most of the commandments is going to get them to heaven. It's those who think, well, I go to church enough and I say these things enough and my parents were Catholic or Methodist and because of that, don't talk about how sinful I am. I would just know I'm a good person and that's going to be enough. That's very offensive to say you are not a good person. I mean, you're good probably in behavior, but in the heart, there's an offense of sin against God. That's offensive. And then there's, it's nonsense to the Gentiles. That's those who would say, oh, you're just talking about sky daddy and the sky daddy stuff. 
No, where it says, no, there is a God that brought the gospel to us to save us. What is the gospel? What is that about? Why is it so offensive? Because the gospel says there is God, and he created, and he's a personal God. And when he created, mankind sinned against him. We have an inner rebellion in all of us against the one true God. That's why we are not liars because we lie. We lie because we're liars. There's something broken. There's something sinful in us. God is Holy, holy, holy. There is no sin that could be in his presence, so you're doomed. I'm doomed unless God does something. We sit under the hell of God, the wrath of God, because of our sins against this holy God. God must do something, and he did. He sent his one and only son into the world who lived the perfect life without sin in our place. Then he goes to the cross to die for our sin. He who knew no sin became your sin, became our sin, and the wrath of God fell upon him, punishing him in our place for our sins. But on the third day, he rose from the grave, showing he defeats sin and evil and death and then ascended to the right hand of the Father where he prays for us today and is coming again. And the whole declaration around Jesus is he's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life and there's no one who gets to the Father but through him. That is offensive. <laughs> to walk into a space where you're saying no, all religions are lies, all cults are lies. There's only one way to the Father, and it's Jesus Christ alone. Oh, you're already offensive. So you, because you hold to the gospel of God. But then you're especially offensive if you hold to the scriptures of God. And what hurts the pastor's heart is to see Christians who are ashamed of their Bible, who are embarrassed by the Bible. When are you kidding me? This is where we know the gospel. This is where we know the heart of God and have a relationship with him through the Holy Spirit, the scriptures of God. So what do the scriptures teach us? Because for many, it's a fairy tale book. So what, and I don't have time to cover all the scriptures other than what does the scripture say that's so offensive? Well, again, it begins with God being the ones who, who's offensive, God. God in the beginning, God, Genesis chapter one, verse one. So if God creates, he has authority over whom he creates. God has full authority over your life and mine. He is not to bend the knee to us, we bend the knee to him. He's our creator. He has the right to do with us whatever he wants. God could hate us and he would still be worthy of worship because he's God. But he's a God who loves and he creates in love. And then there's Adam and Eve in the garden. And he invites them to complete paradise in his presence. He only says, of this tree, don't eat of this tree. Instead, live in my goodness. Trust me, I'm for your good. I'm not holding back on you. I'm not holding back on your desires or your, or your, your, your pleasures. I am your desire and pleasure. I'm what you want. So stay with me. Don't eat of the fruit of the tree. And they ate of the fruit of the tree. How did that even happen? Well, Genesis 3, 1, 4, and 5, the serpent showed up, said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? You will not surely die. You will not be judged for your sin. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And you, know, you follow the story on out. When their eyes were opened. Their eyes weren't opened after they took of the fruit and went, I'm free. No, when their eyes were open, they covered themselves in shame. They were in more bondage than they'd ever known. So how is this an offense? God is the author of what's right, and God is the author of what's wrong. God is the author of what's good, and God has what's, and declares what's evil and declares what's wrong. And so we cannot redefine it according to what we think is good and what we think is evil. What we think is wrong and right based on how I feel or based on what I think of myself, based on my desires. No, it's what God says, and that's an offense. Because God's truth goes directly against our culture's understanding of sexuality, of money, of justice. It's about what God says, and that's the offense that you carry with you when you walk into the room. Because what happened here? Instead of them obeying God, what God said, they question whether God said it. David Platt talks about that. This is that God's command was reduced to a question. God's word became subject to human judgment. We made God bow to our judgment instead of bowing to his. Therefore, whatever feels right to me and whatever my desires say, that's what's right. And that's sin against God. 
And the scriptures declare opposite in the sense of what God says is true, not me. That's an offense. And that's what Tim Keller unpacks here. I'll read this quote from him in my notes. He says, only if your God can say things that outrage you and make you struggle, will you know that you have gotten hold of a real God and not a figment of your imagination. So an authoritative Bible is not the enemy of a personal relationship with God. It is the, <clears throat> pardon me, it is the precondition for it. So the Bible is what anchors us in the gospel and through which the Holy Spirit speaks to us. And the Bible is offensive. So before you even walk into the room and they know you are a true born-again Christian, because what that means about your devotion to God, what that means about your worldview in terms of the true God, what that means about your values, your beliefs, your convictions, you walk into the room in offense, you walk into the room where it's just nonsense, you, you, you walk into the room and you're archaic in what you believe, you walk into the room and the wrong side of history, or whatever those clobber phrases are. And I've got to tell you, as a Christian, walking into that room like that, that's okay. It's okay that you're in offense because Jesus said that's what was going to happen, that those who hated Jesus will hate his people. And I'm talking the true Jesus, not some made-up Jesus people like. The true Jesus who's the only way, truth, and, and salvation. You walk in the room like that because you are not of this world, Christian. You are, you are the, a citizen of another kingdom. You, you have a different passport. You're on the visiting team here. And so anything you hold is an offense, and that's okay. So you don't have to go offensive. Just know that you're walking in the space as a Christ follower, and that has some influence and impact, and that's okay. So know, be encouraged that you're already offensive. Secondly, go prepared. Before you go to the holiday table, the party, and who's going to be there, and the hot topic issues that could come up, go prepared for it. You must be in the scriptures of God for your own heart and soul. You know God through the scriptures. You gotta be spending time with him. You gotta be with him. You gotta be reading, getting the scriptures, getting the scriptures in you. You gotta be praying and connected to the Lord in the moment and throughout your day. You gotta be praying. You gotta be praying knowing that he has given you Christ himself in the Holy Spirit. You have God in you. You have the Holy Spirit in you to counsel you, to encourage you, to guide you, to, to restrain you. You have the fruit of the Holy Spirit of God and you gotta keep that in front of you. And so what's the fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and what? Patience and kindness and goodness, and gentleness, and faithfulness, and self-control. Big words there like patience and peace. Big words like kindness and gentleness. Big words like self-control. All that is the fruit of the Spirit in you before you even get there as well. You're preparing to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. So that's what has to do with your heart. Then what about the environment of those who will be in that environment when you walk into the room. Some, oh, I forgot about this part. If, if, you're, <clears throat> if, if you're hearing fruit of the Spirit and you're going, oh, but pastor, I tried, but my mouth, I just, oh, pray for me, pastor. My mouth just gets out ahead of me. Well, I got a prayer for you, Psalm 141, verse 3, where you need God's personal help. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. And maybe you need to say, an old Lord, set a guard over my phone before my thumb starts texting it out there. Lord, set a guard over my keyboard before I email it out there. Lord, set a guard over my Instagram before I post it out there. Maybe you need that as well. Or maybe you're walking in the place and you know, Lord, watch, help me with my mouth because I get provoked and I get stirred and I get impassioned. I was thinking about over Halloween when kids would come to our door and open the door, take the candy and put it in the thing. We had a, uh, we have a, a boxer named Gus, and he kept trying to run through the door. So I got my leg, and I'm pushing him back, trying to keep him back. And I put a little gate up to open the door into where he could come and just kind of watch. And I think, Lord, be that for my mouth. If my words start to come out, you kick, kick those words back away before they slip out and put the gate up. When they run up to come out, it stops in the moment. And here's why this is important, because it's like toothpaste out of the tube. Once it's out, you're not putting it back in. So if you speak something and you say something, it could have some repercussions you didn't mean to have and you can't take it back. So set a guard, O oh Lord, over my mouth. 
he says. Now, what about them? Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. Now you're in the room. Here's what to go prepared with. The Lord says, the principle is, do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him. But then answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. Well, which is it? What do we do? Well, first of all, let me put this back on you and me to be sure you're not the fool in the folly, all right? Let's start there. But then he, gives, he says two different things. First of all, don't answer them, and then the same breath, he says, answer them. So which is it? It depends on the scenario. you got to have situational awareness. You go with an awareness in the room. You don't walk in with a club in the room. You walk in intelligent, wise. You're situating, you're, you're having awareness of what's in the room, the vibe in the room. There's a, there's a, a of who's in the room. There's also a self-awareness. Did you show up at the party or at the gathering at about a nine out of 10 for some reason? Whether you had didn't get enough sleep or whether you just got the headline news or whatever, or the, you saw the post and you've already walked in a bit provoked, you gotta be aware of that. And pray for the fruit of the spirit to overcome it in your life. Then there's relational awareness. Who's in the room that will love a fight, would love the debate, would love the argument? And, and there are people like that. Uh, uh, there's a story I read this week about the scorpion and the frog. I don't know if you've heard this before. The frog's going to cross, cross, uh, go across the pond, and the scorpion's like, hey, I need a ride. Would you give me a ride? And the frog's like, you're crazy. You're a scorpion. You'll sting me. Oh, I promise I won't, but you will. Oh, I promise I won't but you will. And the frog says, okay, I trust you. So the scorpion gets on the back of the frog. They ride across the other side of the pond. And sure enough, the scorpion stings the frog. And the frog says, I knew it. Why did you sting me? And the scorpion says, listen, I'm a scorpion. That's just what I do. <laughs> so there are people, that's just what they do. Now, hopefully you're not the scorpion. That's not what you do. Meaning you love to provoke. You love a good fight. You want to get in a big argument over the hot topic issues. Come on board again, Christian. Think of the fruit of the spirit in your life. So you got to have a relational awareness. You got to have a, a, a self-awareness, a situational awareness as it, as it speaks of here. Oh, here, here, see if this helps. So there are three questions you ought to kind of answer before you get to where you're going. Again, office party, holiday gathering, and the hot button issues that can come up. Ask these three questions about if you respond or don't respond, if you engage or don't engage. Here's the first question. Are there polar opposite beliefs at play when you get there? If you have a polar opposite belief than what they have, I don't see how a conversation out loud in front of people is going to benefit anybody. Second question to ask is, is there, or is there an openness to listen and to have fruitful conversation? I'm doubtful that that's going to happen in a, in a public moment around a table or in a group. Maybe if you speak of it in private later, but can you imagine, in the, even in private, but especially in the environment, is there any hope for that, really? And then thirdly, is this is the big one, is can you really change their mind or can they really change your mind? And I'm pretty convinced neither is going to happen. I, I think of the quote that says, no one has ever been persuaded by losing the argument. So why go there? Maybe that's all you need to know to keep it within. Because some people say, no, no, no. I, I'm just, what I'm doing is when it opens, I'm just going to plant seeds. No, you're probably planting IEDs, <laughs> improvised explosive devices as you drop them there. So that's not going to get you very far as well. Proverbs 20 verse three, it is an honor for a man and a woman to keep aloof from strife, but every fool will be quarreling. So when you hear words like wisdom and foolishness, foolishness really can be talked of in the sense of someone being just not intelligent. Like it's unintelligent to be quarrelsome and angry and easily provoked, where honor and wisdom is for those who can remove themselves from it, can stay above it, can keep aloof. I love the word aloof there in the translation because it means you're present, but you've distanced yourself. You're present, but you're detached. You're present, but you're not going to let it provoke you. And that's what he's speaking of here. And probably the best thing to do when you, when you go to be prepared is just not say anything. Just be silent. Because there's much in the scriptures, Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 3, Proverbs chapter 10 verse 19, it says where there is many words, there is foolishness. And then you got it. I'm going to throw some Abraham Lincoln on you today. How about that? Here's what he said. He said, it's better to remain silent and be thought of as a fool than to speak out and remove all doubt. <laughs> so maybe you go prepared in such a way.
So know you're already offensive when you go there. And if it goes there, uh, go prepared. And thirdly, if it goes there and you engage, be kind. So let's say you engage. Let's say something is spoken of and it's so, it's so out of touch. It's so horrendous in your eyes. It was something, uh, uh, almost a, a lie that was spoken and you feel compelled that you must speak up. Okay, let's say that happens. So how do you do it? Well, you do it with kindness. So let's talk about being kind. I read this quote this week that said, anger is one letter short of danger. I'll let you process the letters there for a minute because it took me a minute. <laughs> Anger is one letter short of danger. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 9. Do not be qu quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. So if you go with anger in your lap already, you're going to be easily provoked. And what, where, where, does, where does the anger come from your lap? It often is pride. Often it's contempt. Contempt is one of the most deadly realities that will kill a marriage. How much more so in any relationship, even at a gathering? Contempt means you're superior. Contempt means, sees the person as less than their person, as less than them. And what can come out of that? Uh, being easily provoked. Uh, so if, if you find yourself... No, let me say it this way. I think it would be good for every one of us three days, at least three days before we go to the holiday gathering with our family or to the office party, I, I say let's do this. Let's fast from Fox News and CNN for three days before we get there. Let's, let's remove all the ones or, 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 or mute all the ones who post the things that provoke us. I think that's the way to go because if you're in CNN and Fox News and the posts and these talking heads right before you get to the party, you're already provoked, man. It's going to take very little. So maybe instead of spending so much time in Fox News and CNN, maybe you spend the most time right here to be with him and to have the fruit of his spirit in your heart and in your life. Proverbs 15 verse 1 shows how to be kind really practically here. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Now, we're using Proverbs a lot in our series because Proverbs are, are they're not like a text you read, you read through like a narrative. Proverbs are, are diamonds. They just have, just, they're kind of all over the place. And Proverbs are not promises. Proverbs are principles. So the promise, it's not saying I promise you if you give a a soft answer in a harsh situation, it's going to work out. That's not what it says. It's saying there's the principle that most likely it, it's going to happen more than not that when you use a soft answer, it can turn away someone's wrath. And when you use scripture, you're inviting God into it when you seek to apply his principle. So a soft answer, I'm convinced that it's rarely the hot button issue that's the issue. It's often the people who are involved in debating or discussing or dialoguing about the hot button issue because tones rise, provocation happens. I'm going to make my point. I'm going to put you in your place and, and, and tensions and tone goes up. But God says a soft answer. That's someone who says, you know, at the end of the day, I'm going to care more about this relationship than being right. I'm going to, I'm going to care more about the peace than making my point. I'm going to, with a soft answer, kind of take the sting out of the room and bring everybody into peace instead of jumping in and being drawn into a storm. That's a soft answer. And then it speaks of a soft tongue. A soft tongue, Proverbs Proverb 25, 15, will break a bone. I love that wisdom. So, because often we think to break the bone or to, or to break through the hard heart or to break through the resistance, that that means I yell or that means I get heated in my tone or that means I give the stare down or I give the perfect amount of sarcasm and that's going to break through their resistance. And the principle is, no, no, you have a better shot at it when you have a soft tongue, when you're, when you're soft, when you're humble, when you're respectful, even if they don't deserve it, you get God involved within it. And then there's the timing of our words. Right in the moment, at the, in the, at the table, at the party, whatever that might be, can you say something that is really helpful, 
But in the end, it's just the wrong timing in which you do it. Because if it's the wrong timing, it can still IED it or bring an, uh, an ignoring of it. So listen to this passage. Weird passage to make the point, but watch. Proverbs 27, 14. Whoever blesses his neighbor with a loud voice, rising early in the morning, will be counted as a cursing. And we all said, amen. Some of you are that person. Don't do that anymore. All right? But, but no, what, what is he saying then? That's a picture of what he's saying is this. You can mean well, but your timing and your tone be off, and it'll be like a cursing. So notice, those, uh, I'm sorry, whoever blesses, that means well, a blessing. But it's a loud voice, that's a tone. Early in the morning, morning that's the timing. So the Proverbs are clear. You can say a blessing, you can say the perfect thing, but if the timing and the tone is off, it can be received like a cursing. Proverbs eleven seventeen: 17, those who are kind benefit themselves, but the cruel bring ruin on themselves. So I love how the proverb brings it back to the speaker to saying, if you, if you want to benefit yourself in this situation, the best thing you can do for yourself to keep the peace within yourself and everywhere else is to be kind. Don't be cruel because it can bring a ruin upon your reputation, on how, your peop- how people view you now. Kindness, this word kind is, comes from the word hesed. Hesed is a Hebrew word that is the character of God. It's unfailing love and his loving kindness. So this is the fruit of the spirit again, this kindness. Kindness in the end, in a way, is showing more patience and respect to someone than they deserve. That's kindness. Kindness... <laughs> Maybe it's because I'm in my 50s now and I've kind of toned down a bit and, and chilled a bit. But I think if anything goes down with anyone, in any, whether it's in traffic, whether you're provoked at the office or at school or on the team or, or at the holiday table, you can always be kind. You can always be kind. And here's why. Cruelty is not a fruit of the Spirit. Anger is not a fruit of the spirit. Arguing is not a fruit of the spirit. Rolling your eyes is not a fruit of the spirit. Sorry. (laughs) Sarcasm is not a fruit of the spirit. And so as born again Christians, we are to have the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Yeah. And you can trust God to work out the rest. So if you're going to the place and the conversation goes there, you got to go there knowing you're offensive. You got to go there prepared. You got to go there ready to be kind. And then finally, we'll land it here. You got to keep the main thing, the main thing. So let's land it with what Jesus does in this situation. Jesus faces two different parties here and uh, a couple of conversations with him that go there. He's having a conversation with the conservatives and another conversation with the liberals. The, convers- the conservatives are the Pharisees, and they're coming at it from a term of politics. The Sadducees are the liberals, and they're coming at it from, a, from an angle of religion. So let's talk about the conservatives first. They have a political question, and it's around taxes. Taxes was a very hot topic among the Jews in their day. They were crushed by taxes. And They also believed that to give taxes to a pagan ruler was, in a sense, worshiping the ruler instead of God. So this was a big deal for them. So for Jesus, in the end, to say, well, you need to pay your taxes to the Jews, that would be like him promoting Caesar to be worshipped. And it would also be endorsing heavy taxes on his own people. So that's not a good thing. But also, if he said, don't pay your taxes, well, that's rebellion against Caesar. So they show up with a gotcha question. And that's what happens, right? Especially if they know you're a Christian walking in the room. Uh, Watch out for the gotcha question. And this is what they do with Jesus, Luke 20. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? Gotcha. But he he perceived their gotcha, their craftiness, and he said to them, show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? And they said, Caesar's. And he said, ah, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Don't you wish we were all as brilliant as Jesus? So he answered them very calmly. He's already an offense. That's why they're trying to do the gotcha. But he answered them very calmly and wisely. So he says, 
the coin, he says, has Caesar's image on it. So whatever has Caesar's image, give to that which is Caesar's. And then he's kind of looking at him going, but whoever has God's image, give it to God, which is you and me who bear the image of God. What a response. So Jesus responding in such a way, you got to know that answer was definitely not satisfying for them. Just like it might not be satisfying for the answer you give. But Jesus refused to get bogged down in some political back and forth and just drove it to the main thing, which is relationship with God. Now, I don't know, I don't know how to tell you how that might look in your conversation, but the point, a big point I'm making is that Jesus kept the main thing the main thing. And sometimes the main thing means you stay silent so you don't jeopardize the main thing. Or if you're directly asked a question, you're compelled to answer it. And you either say, hey, can we talk about that offline here in a few minutes? Or you're compelled to answer it then. You answer it in such a way that they might not be satisfied, but you're keeping the gospel front and center in your heart and before them. So that's the conservatives. How about the liberals? They asked the religious question because they didn't believe in a physical resurrection. They once you died, it was over and you would not be with God. So the scenario is this. They, they bring this... They bring this scenario in which there's a woman, they say. They say to Jesus, there's this woman. She married a man. They didn't have any sons, and he died. So they, she married a brother. Then he died, and then she married his brother, and he died, and she married his brother, and he died. Up to seven brothers. Now, if I'm Jesus, I'm kind of sitting there going, who's this woman? <laughs> and what are these dudes doing? I don't even know what they're doing. What are they thinking? But here's what happens here. Luke 20, 33. In the resurrection, they asked Jesus, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had her as a wife. Gotcha. And then Jesus answers in verse 34 and on. He talks about how in heaven, uh, there, there, we will not be given in marriage or we won't be married there. We're going to be like angels. We're not going to be angels. We will be like angels, not giving in marriage, and we'll all be the children of God. So he starts there, answers their question in a direct way, but definitely not, not satisfying, and then he turns it into the main thing direction that they weren't expecting. He says, but that the dead are raised. They weren't even asking really that, but he said that the dead are raised. Even Moses showed in the passage about the bush where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. So he's moving everything up on the Lord and off of their conversation and what they're saying. And basically what he answered was this, is that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not God was the God of them. Because if he was, they're not resurrected. But he is right now in this moment, their God, meaning they are with him alive and well in the moment. That's how he answered what an answer. Not satisfying, but he kept the main thing, the main thing. Jesus' identity and his security was not in his political leanings in which he had none, but it was in the love and security of his father. And he was on one mission, and that was to save the lost and disciple the found. That's it. So that should be our mission. That should be at the forefront of our hearts and ought to compel us in how we respond or don't respond when it comes to heated moments. So to be like Jesus, we don't go looking for a battle. We don't go looking for an argument. Our identity is secure in him, and we are filled with his spirit and trusting his spirit will give us wisdom to navigate. That our identity and security is not in, a, is not in any kind of politics or any kind of uh, leanings, because if you are, if that's where your identity is found, you will be an angry person. You, you will be compelled to be cruel and sarcastic and loud. But if your identity and security is in the love of the Father, in Christ Jesus, oh, now you got it. Now I've got it. That you can go knowing you're already in offense and you're okay with that. But you also go knowing you're prepared. And you go ready to be filled with the Spirit and to be kind. And you go with the heart that says, I'm going to keep the main thing the main thing. Amen? Is that helpful? Is that helpful for y'all? Good. Helpful to two people here. That's good. All right. Let's pray together. Lord, I love your word. I love it so much. Thank you for the power of your word and the presence of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I do pray you help us as maybe some of us have the best families and we don't have to worry about this kind of thing. 
but I can imagine we all have someone in our lives, around our lives, whether it's the holiday table or, the, or at the office or the party or uh, uh, in the dorm room or so many places. So, Lord, I pray, help our unbelief to find our identity and security in you, knowing you've given us the Holy Spirit. You've given us your Holy Spirit and Christ in us, the hope of glory. So I pray, help us to live as Christ lived, to answer as Christ answered. Give us his brilliance, his wisdom, in the timing and the tone and the heart in which to respond and the wisdom, the answers in which to have, in which to respond and to have his heart as well, to keep the main thing, the main thing. Mm. Thank you for all these precious people, God, and I pray your word has been profitable to, for their hearts today. And I pray you'd bless them as they go about their day, their week, and the tables in which they'll sit. Be glorified in us, and it's in your great name, Jesus, I pray. We all said amen. amen.